The best moon base is no moon base. That's the kind of thing that Elon Musk would probably say if he was asked about how to build the first permanent settlement on the moon. And it may sound like typical business guru nonsense, but this particular Muskism is exactly what we need to actually move forward with establishing a human presence on the moon. This is a massive project that will require the engineering efficiency and design minimalism that SpaceX and Tesla have become famous for. A true first principles approach. This is how SpaceX plans to build the first moon base. Now, the easy answer to the problem is that SpaceX doesn't need to build a moon base because they're already building a giant starship that will land on the moon and support a crew of astronauts for days at a time. The vehicle itself is essentially designed from the ground up to be its own portable moon base, like a mobile home. So what we want to do here is create the equivalent of a trailer park on the moon, where we take these mobile rockets and convert them into permanent habitats. But first, let's take a look at our lunar lander starship and try to figure out what's going on inside this thing. From the outside, we have a very different looking starship compared with what we know today. The lunar starship is always shown with white paint instead of raw stainless steel. I assume this is more of a marketing choice than anything. We also have a very noticeable lack of wings and heat shield tiles, and that's because these lunar ships are not designed for a return to Earth. They are destined to remain on or around the moon forever, which is how we arrive at the conclusion that they might as well be turned into something useful instead of just becoming humongous space junk. One of the quirks of the Starship design is that it will be very tall, but only the top third will actually be useful for crew and cargo on the Artemis mission. The rest of the body is all fuel tanks, these are going to be refilled in orbit around the Earth before the Starship sets off for its journey to the lunar surface. After accelerating into a translunar injection, then decelerating to capture into the Moon's orbit and slow down again to start falling towards the lunar surface, those fuel tanks should be more or less empty again. The final Moon landing maneuver on Starship is going to be handled by a new set of thrusters mounted on the sides of the vehicle just above the main fuel tanks. These could be the same hypergolic Draco thrusters that SpaceX uses on the Dragon capsule, or they might be something entirely new. But either way, there's a good reason for these landing engines to be set so far up on the vehicle. Remember how the Odysseus lander tipped over during its attempted moon landing? Well, just like the Starship, Odysseus was tall and narrow, so very susceptible to tipping, particularly on the moon, where the force of gravity holding you down is much weaker than the Earth, but the force on inertia remains the same. In simple terms, it only takes about one-fourth the amount of energy to tip something over on the Moon as it would on the Earth. This is important to remember for later, because we are going to be tipping stuff over on purpose. But in the case of a Moon landing, when you absolutely do not want your spaceship to fall down, moving your control thrusters as close to the vehicle's center of gravity as possible will result in the best possible stability. Moving to the inside of the Starship, we are envisioning three main levels that contain approximately 1,000 cubic meters of internal volume. The bottom is going to have to be our cargo bay, located just above the landing thrusters. That's where the main door and the ground elevator are going to be located. Even on the moon, you can't just jump 50 feet to the ground, so the crew is going to use an elevator to travel to and from the surface of the moon and they'll be bringing along plenty of equipment and experiments to use during their multi-day layover on the moon, so this will be stored in the lower level along with EVA suits and critical supplies like food, oxygen, and water. Above the cargo hold, we see rows of windows that would indicate the main crew compartment. This is going to be space for communication with Earth, command operations of the Starship, crew downtime, and daily exercise. Then above that, we could put the crew sleeping quarters, the space toilet, and sanitation equipment. The very top of the ship, up in the pointy bit, is going to be an airlock and docking port for zero gravity crew transfer from the Orion capsule or gateway station into the starship, and then back again. So this section won't be used at all while on the moon. 
So in its landing configuration, that's about all there is to the Lunar Starship, more than enough for the intended purpose of supporting two astronauts for five days on the moon, but not exactly ideal as a long-term habitat for a new human lunar outpost until you start flipping everything on its side. Imagine floating through space, high above the world, on your very own luxurious observation platform. Sounds like a fantasy, but it could be a reality sooner than you think. Space Perspective is a new entry into the space tourism industry, and they are doing things different. Space balloons. Get higher than any airplane could possibly reach without rocket engines, without free-falling, without any vomit-inducing g-forces, just floating gently into the upper atmosphere. Sounds like the kind of business that could really take off, right? Well, here's the deal. Space exploration startups like Space Perspective are not publicly traded companies. They do still have investors though, and access to these companies is only given to wealthy insiders like venture capitalists and private equity firms. But not anymore. Link2 is a platform that removes barriers to investing in the future of space exploration giving you the opportunity to get in early on companies like Axiom Space, Astranis, Quantum Space, and Space Perspective. Link2 is already providing over 700,000 everyday investors access to private investing, and because you are viewers of this channel, you get a $500 discount on your first investment using the discount code on the screen. Take advantage of this limited time promotion by clicking the link in the description below. All right, first things first, in order to convert our transport rocket into a moon base, we need to tip it over onto the side. There are a few reasons that we need to do this, but we'll cover that once we get the job done. So while it will definitely be easier to tip over a starship on the moon, it's still going to be a tricky procedure, right? The idea is that with only around one sixth the gravitational pull of the Earth, the ship will be much more susceptible to sideways influence meaning that if you pull from the very tip of the nose cone to gain the maximum amount of leverage, then you won't actually have to pull very hard to get the whole thing to fall over. We could maybe rig up a moon rover or two with a cable and just pull the thing over depending on how much traction can be achieved in the lunar dust. That could be a limiting factor. You could anchor an electric winch into the ground or a very big rock or the base of another starship and use that for your lateral force as well. Another thing I've been wondering, whether you would really need a counterweight system to stop the ship from just free falling right over onto the ground at all, or if it would be fine on its own. The Starship is designed to hit the Earth's atmosphere belly first at over 26,000 kilometers per hour, so I can't imagine that a shortfall in very low gravity onto some soft sand covered ground would do much harm, but I could be wrong. Either way, once we've got it laying down on its side, now it's time to start our renovations. So we are moving from a vertical layout to horizontal. This is going to help us make much better use of the space that's available inside the Starship, but it's also going to be a lot of work gutting the old interior and installing a new lengthwise floor plan. That's honestly the biggest sticking point of this whole idea. In theory, it sounds really cool, but in practice, we'd be doing the equivalent of remodeling a house, but on the moon, in a spacesuit, with a very limited amount of resources at our disposal and a high probability of death or disaster. I think it might be one of those things that we just have to assume that robots will be able to do it for us and we put our faith in the Tesla bot. But assuming that we can unlock the entire 50 meter length and nine meter width of the Starship body and kit it out with everything that we need to survive and explore 400,000 kilometers away from home, then at that point, we have ourselves one hell of a moon base. In theory, we want to maintain the most simple yet effective interior layout possible, something that maximizes comfort and ease of use. So in my mind at least, it makes the most sense to go with an open concept Starship moon base. We make one level floor from front to back, maybe about one third of the way up the circumference of the rocket. That way we get some nice space under the floor for equipment and storage, Plus we get a nice high ceiling to minimize the effect of claustrophobia on our future moon settlers. Then we can chunk up the length of the ship into various amenities that people are going to need. A research and science laboratory, a communal rec room, a mess hall and kitchen, a gym and sanitation station, and a bunk room for sleeping quarters. Nothing fancy, but relatively comfortable. So with the construction phase complete, now we need to protect our moon base from the elements. 
There won't be any wind or rain that we need to take shelter from, but there will be no shortage of meteorites and cosmic radiation. Around 100 ping pong ball sized meteors impact the moon every single day. And with no atmosphere to slow them down, those little chunks of space rock reach the surface moving at 72 kilometers per second. The amount of kinetic energy that they carry is equivalent to three kilograms of dynamite. With no magnetic field for protection, the surface of the moon is bombarded with cosmic radiation from solar wind. Radiation exposure like this probably wouldn't kill a person instantly, but it will lead to genetic mutation over time, and that means cancer. The best defense that we have against both of these threats is a thick layer of lunar soil, also known as regolith, that would cover the entire starship. And we need a lot of it. A 5 meter thick covering of regolith is required for effective shielding from cosmic radiation and small meteorite impacts. As for large meteorite impacts, no one ever said this was going to be a safe trip. Now, the beauty of the Starship is that SpaceX has plans to build a lot of these things, up to one rocket leaving the factory every day, and they won't even be that expensive to launch. So, in theory, we can have as many Starships on the moon as we want, and not all of them need to land there with people on board. The first few lunar Starships will be reserved for Artemis missions, but future ships could land carrying just supplies or robots. We could land a Starship tanker that is just full of water or hydrogen fuel. The possibilities are pretty near endless. As long as you can fit a piece of infrastructure inside the top third of a starship, you can send it to the moon. Which is pretty crazy when you think about it. I mean, it's not that crazy when you remember that the whole reason Elon Musk and SpaceX designed the starship was to build a city of 1 million people on the planet Mars, so just colonizing the moon should theoretically be pretty damn easy by comparison. But it does provide the perfect opportunity to practice and test out these systems before we send the whole thing to Mars.